Let's say we have P of T, and it's gonna be a function representing a population of bacteria over time. Negative 1,911 T squared plus 84,000 T plus 20,000. This is what happens when we get into real life situations with real life numbers. They're not nice and controlled anymore. Anything could happen here. This is still a controlled problem. It's still going to work out nicer than real world stuff would. But anyway, this function represents a population of bacteria after T hours. When is the maximum population? What is the maximum? Population. So two different questions here. Well, an ordered pair here, our input would be T our output would be P of T, whatever we get when we put T into the function. So the X coordinate being time, when is gonna come from the X. And then the actual output at that time, that's gonna be the what. Notice both of these are asking about a maximum. When does maximum happen? At the vertex. So specifically, the X coordinate of the vertex will be our time, that's gonna be H. And then the output when we plug H in, that's K, the Y coordinate of the vertex. So each piece of the vertex will give us an answer to a different question. The input, the time, that's going to be the when of it all. And when we plug the time in, we get the actual population, the output. That'll answer the question of what the population is. Vertex formula again. That's why I reviewed that just now. H is going to be negative B over 2A. B is positive 84,000. A is negative 1,911. The opposite of B, negative 84,000 over two times A, two times negative 1911. Negative 84,000 over negative 3,822. Negative over negative is positive. And I'm gonna go ahead and divide using a calculator, 84,000 divided by 3822. I get about 21.978. We're gonna round that to 22 hours. When is the maximum population? It happens at 22 hours, 21.978 to be exact. 
So I guess these numbers weren't controlled after all, says 21.978. What is the maximum population? Well, for that, we would need to find P of 22. We would need to find what we get when we plug 22 in. Negative 1911 times 22 squared plus 84,000 times 22 plus 20,000. So at 22 hours, we get a max population. And again, the reason it's a maximum is because A is negative. It's a parabola opening down the vertex is a maximum point. I'm gonna use my calculator to help again. 22 squared, 22 times 22 is 484. 84,000 times 22, 1,848,000, million plus 20,000, just doing a little bit at a time, order of operations, 1911 times 484. That's gonna be negative 924924. And if I just go across here, negative 924924 plus 1848000 plus 20,000 943076. So that would be our total population. P of X is a profit function. Specifically, it's going to be negative 30x squared plus 1,320x plus 4,830. X is the number of cars produced per shift. Like I said, P of X is the daily profit. Let's find the maximum possible daily profit. When we hear maximum, we think of the vertex of a parabola where it's on top, where it's the maximum point, the uppermost point. And sure enough, this is a parabola because it has an X squared. The vertex point is HK, where X equals H is the maximum input. In this case, it would be the maximum X, the maximum number of cars, which would give us Y equals K, the maximum profit. We want to find the maximum profit, which means we need to find H so that we can find K. And we know that H is negative B over 2A. B is 1320, so negative B is negative 1320 times 2a, a is negative 30. So we're looking for negative 1320 over negative 60. Negative over negative is positive. Cut off a zero too, divide them both by 10. 132 over six. Six goes into 13 twice, 
remainder of one, bring down the two, six goes into 12 twice evenly. So this is 22. We know that H is 22. How could we find K? How do we find the output of a function? We need to find P of 22. How do we find P of 22? Plug it in, plug it in, plug it in. We found that maximum number of cars we can build in a day is 22 before profit starts going down. What is this maximum profit? We're about to find out. Twenty two squared. That's twenty two times twenty two. That's four eighty four. Negative thirty times four eighty four plus thirteen twenty times twenty two. Thirteen twenty times 22 is 29,040 plus 4,830, 484, times 30, negative times positive is negative. Negative 14,520 plus 29,040 plus 4,830. Negative 14,000 plus 29,000, that pushes it into the positives. We can subtract to find out where we land. Pushes us to positive 14,520. plus 4830 $19,350 would be the maximum daily profit. The objectives in this topic are identify polynomial functions, recognize characteristics of graphs of polynomial functions, determine end behavior, use factoring to find zeros of polynomial functions, identify zeros and their multiplicities, use the intermediate value theorem, understand the relationship between degree and turning points, and graph polynomial functions. So here we have the definition of a polynomial function. And I'll simplify it because it looks kind of scary. There's all these different letters and all these different sizes. Uh, but it says, let n be a non-negative integer. 
And let a sub n, a sub n minus 1 through a sub 2 and a sub 1 and a sub 0 all be real numbers, with a sub n not equal to 0. The function defined by this, and I will come back and read it, is called a polynomial function of degree n. The number a sub n, the coefficient of the variable to the highest power, is called the leading coefficient. Okay, let me start breaking this down. We'll start with the last thing that was said. a sub n, this thing right here, is the leading coefficient. It is the coefficient to the variable that has the highest power. This is the highest power because we have n, and then it keeps decreasing, n minus 1, then n minus 2, n minus 3, all the way down to 2, to 1, to 0, where there wouldn't be an x at all. Earlier, it was said that a sub n couldn't be 0. The reason for that is if a sub n was 0, if the leading coefficient is 0, that exponent disappears. And it's no longer of degree n. Degree n because n is the largest exponent. So we have the variable with the largest exponent, the highest power. Its coefficient is the leading coefficient. Every term of a polynomial, when it's written in this form, will be decreasing powers of x, decreasing powers of the variable. And it doesn't go negative, which is why n has to be a non-negative integer. If we did have x to negative powers, it would not be a polynomial function. Um, and I think that I can go ahead and read this function now, and we'll have more of an understanding of what all the pieces mean. So a polynomial function in this form is f of x equals a sub n x to the n plus a sub n minus 1 x to the n minus 1 plus all the way through a sub 2 x squared plus a sub 1 x plus a sub 0. So polynomial functions of degree 2 or higher have graphs that are smooth and continuous. Now, by smooth, we mean that the graph contains only rounded curves, no sharp corners. So the absolute value graph, for instance, would not be a polynomial function because it comes to that sharp corner to make that V shape. But parabolas, cubics, um, they're all rounded. So they're smooth, and by continuous, we mean that the graphs have no breaks and can be drawn without lifting your pencil from the rectangular coordinate system. So a piecewise defined function, for instance, um, where there's two different graphs coming together on one graph, unless they meet and have no discontinuity. In other words, not only do they meet at a value, but that value exists, it's continuous at that value. Um, can it be a polynomial function? And even then it would have to be meeting at a curve and not a sharp corner. So the odds that a piecewise defined function is also a polynomial function, slim to none. Smooth and continuous. Now the behavior of the graph of a function to the far left or the far right is called its end behavior. So when we talk about the end behavior of the graph, we're asking what's happening at negative infinity to the far left of the graph. What's happening at positive infinity to the far right of the graph? 
So it may have intervals where it increases or decreases. It could go up for some bit. It could go down for some bit. It could remain constant for some bit. Um, eventually, it's going to rise or fall without bound. And I take back what I said about it being constant of some bit. It probably isn't constant. Maybe, but let's just go with increasing and decreasing. Uh, because eventually it will rise or fall forever. The sine of the leading coefficient, a sub n, and the degree n of the polynomial function reveal its n behavior. And I'll simplify this as well uh, when we look at the next slide. But in technical terms, we have the leading coefficient test. As x increases or decreases without bound, in other words, as it approaches positive or negative infinity, the graph of the polynomial function eventually rises or falls. In particular, the sign of the leading coefficient and the degree of the polynomial function reveal its end behavior. So we have these four shapes here, and these four shapes can be simplified even more to having the same general behavior as x cubed of negative x cubed of x squared and of negative x squared. x squared would be a parabola, goes up forever on the left and on the right. Negative x squared would be an upside down parabola, going down forever on the left and on the right. x cubed is our general cubic shape that would go up forever on the right and down forever on the left. Negative x cubed would be that flipped upside down, so it would go up forever on the left and down forever on the right. So the one that's like x cubed and the one that's like x squared, those happen when our leading coefficient is positive, when a sub n is greater than zero. The other ones, the negative x cubed and the negative x squared, happen when our leading coefficient is negative a sub n less than zero. The ones that are like the cubic happen when the degree, when the exponent, the highest exponent, is odd. The ones that are like x squared happen when the leading exponent is even. So here, what's the leading well, let's read the question first. Use the leading coefficient test to determine the end behavior of the graph of f of x equals x to the fourth minus 4x squared. What's the highest power? What's the degree? The degree is 4. Is 4 even or odd? It's even, so it's going to be like x squared. Is the leading coefficient positive or negative? It's positive. There's nothing there, so that's a positive one. So it's going to be like positive x squared. It's going to go up to the left. It's going to go up to the right. So the degree is 4, which is even. The leading coefficient is positive. So just like x squared, it rises to the left and it rises to the right. How do we know the rest of that stuff that happens? Well, that's what we're going to get into. But right now, the leading coefficient test tells us that it rises to the left and it rises to the right. If it had been negative x to the fourth, then this would be flipped upside down. It would fall to the left and fall to the right. 
If it had been X cubed, uh, this side would be going up, but the left side would be going down. If it was negative X cubed, the left side would be going up, the right side would be going down. So what about these things? Negative two, zero, and two, where the graph crosses or touches the x-axis when the function value is equal to zero. Well, those are called zeros of the function. If f is a polynomial function, then the values of x for which f of x is equal to zero are called the zeros of f. These values of x are also called the roots. They are the solutions of the polynomial equation f of x equals zero. Each real root of the polynomial equation appears as an x-intercept of the graph of the polynomial function. So before we do example five, let me go back to this last function again. Negative two, zero, and two would be the solutions of x to the fourth minus four x squared equals zero. We know that because those are x-intercepts. Okay, let's find all zeros of f of x equals x cubed plus 2x squared minus 4x minus 8. Well, we find the zeros by taking our equation, setting f of x equal to 0, and solving the resulting equation. The only way we know how to solve something like this is with factoring by grouping. So we group the first two terms. We group the last two terms. From the first two terms, we can factor out an x squared. From the last two terms, we can factor out a negative 4. Now we see there's a common factor of x plus 2. We can factor that out, and we're left with x squared minus 4. That x squared minus 4 can factor further because it's a difference of squares. This is going to be x plus 2 times x minus 2. Or we can just jump straight ahead to setting them both equal to 0. x plus 2 equals 0 gives us x equals negative 2 x squared minus 4 equals 0 would be x squared equals 4, which gives us x equals plus or minus 2. We already had minus 2, but this one gives us plus 2 as well. Had we factored this to get x plus 2 times x minus 2, that also would have given us a negative 2 and a positive 2. Now, the fact that we got negative 2 twice is going to be important when it comes to drawing the graph. But for now, we know that the zeros are negative 2 and positive 2. That means that each of those are x-intercepts. Notice we got negative 2 twice, and at negative 2, we bounce off the x-axis. We don't actually cross it. We got positive 2 once, and at positive 2, we cross the axis. Those are not unrelated facts. If we have an even number of times that the root happens, in this case 2, it's going to bounce. If we have an odd number of times that the root happens, in this case it was 1, we cross. And those numbers, those values 2 and 1, refer to the multiplicity of the 0. If r is a 0 of even multiplicity, the graph touches and turns around at r. If r is a zero of odd multiplicity, the graph crosses at r. And that's the x-axis that it touches or crosses. 
Regardless of whether the multiplicity of a zero is even or odd, graphs tend to flatten out near zeros with multiplicity greater than one. What does that last sentence mean? If we go back to this Had this been a root that appears three times instead of one, it would have kind of crossed at a flatter angle. But what's important to understand is the even touches odd crosses. So here is a scary looking function, but it's thankfully given in factored form already. So when we want to find the zeros and give the multiplicity of each, we go to set the equation equal to zero, and we can solve by using the zero product property right away. Each of these factors would have to be equal to zero. Negative 4 equals 0. That's a false statement. We can just disregard that. But we'll have x plus 1 half squared equals 0, and x minus 5 cubed equals 0. The fact that this is x plus 1 half times x plus 1 half, because of the square, means that our zero of x equals negative one half is going to happen twice. It's going to have a multiplicity two. The exponent directly tells us that. The fact that x minus five cubed means x minus five times x minus five times x minus five, that means our zero of x equals positive five is going to have multiplicity three. That root happens three times. The exponent directly tells us that. So with even multiplicity, we are going to bounce off of the axis. So we're going to bounce at negative one half. With odd multiplicity, we're going to cross. We're going to cross at x equals 5. So this is what I was saying before. The higher the multiplicity, the more flat we're actually going to go through. So for multiplicity one, it was just a straight line. But for multiplicity three, it kind of bends and flattens as it crosses at five before continuing to go down. And we bounce at negative one half. I say bounce, they say touch and turn around. The other one crossed. Now, if we want to bring that together with the uh, leading coefficient test, we have a negative 4. This would give us an x squared, and we'd be multiplying that by an x cubed. Add the exponents. x squared times x cubed would be an x to the fifth. So the leading coefficient would be a negative 4x to the fifth. That's negative. That's odd. It's going to have the same thing as negative x cubed. It's going to rise to the left. It's going to fall to the right. So you can see how each of these little things we're learning now are going to help us with drawing a polynomial function to the best of our ability. The intermediate value theorem. Let f be a polynomial function with real coefficients. If f of a and f of b have opposite signs, then there is at least one value of c between a and b for which f of c equals zero. 
Equivalently, the equation f of x equals zero has at least one root between a and b. Okay, what? <laughs> Let me take a sip of coffee and then dive into this. Okay, if f of a and f of b have opposite signs, that means the function has one positive and one negative. That means that f of a is, for instance, above the x-axis, f of b is below the x-axis, or vice versa. That means that between a and b somewhere on the x-axis, we had to have crossed the x-axis. There has to be a value where the function equals zero. So there is some c between a and b where the function is zero if f of a and f of b have opposite signs. And that's just saying, if you're having one positive y above the x-axis and one negative y below the x-axis, at some point, at some x in between, you crossed the x-axis. So let's show that the polynomial function f of x equals 3x cubed minus 10x plus 9 has a real 0 between negative 3 and negative 2. If that's true, if we cross the x-axis between negative 3 and negative 2, then f of negative 3 and f of negative 2 have to have opposite signs, one above and one below the x-axis. So we evaluate the function at negative 3. We evaluate the function at negative 2. We take negative 3 and we plug it in. We plug it in everywhere, so that's negative 3 cubed. And that's a negative 10 times a negative 3. 3 times negative 27 is negative 81. Negative 10 times negative 3 is positive 30, then our plus 9. We end up with negative 42. So we want to show that f of negative 2 has a positive function value. And sure enough, when we plug negative 2 in, we get positive 5. That means somewhere between negative 3 and negative 2, we had to have crossed the x-axis to go from negatives to positives. And if we look at that graph, sure enough, we do cross between negative 3 and negative 2. At negative 3, our point was down at negative 42. At negative 2, our point was up at 5. The sign change shows that there's a 0. This graph, we notice, turns once, twice. It completely changes direction from increasing to decreasing and from decreasing to increasing. The degree of this particular function was 3. This is a cubic. In general, if f is a polynomial function of degree n, then the graph of f has at most n minus 1 turning points. So that last one, it was degree 3. It has at most 3 minus 1 or 2 turning points. And we saw that it, in fact, had 2. But there would be no cubic that turns three times. There would be nothing to the fifth power that turns more than four times. There would be nothing to the seventh power that turns more than six times. So putting it all together, graphing a polynomial function, first we would use the leading coefficient test to determine the end behavior. Then we'd find our x-intercepts by setting it equal to zero and solving. In the complete factorization of the function, if the root occurs an even number of times, 
if we have a factor to an even power that bounces, it touches the x-axis and turns around. If the root happens an odd number of times, if our factor is cubed or fifth or seventh, any odd power, then we cross at the zero that that factor gives us. And as we saw, if the multiplicity is greater than one, the graph flattens out near the zero. One thing we didn't do, but it is great to get another point, is to find the y-intercept by computing f of zero. In other words, plug zero in for x and get the y-intercept. Some other things we can bring in from what we've done in the past. If there's symmetry, we could use that to help draw the graph. And we know when we draw the graph, the number of turning points can't be more than one less than the degree. So let's use our strategy to graph f of x equals 2 times x plus 2 squared times x minus 3. For the end behavior, we would need the leading term so we can see the leading coefficient and so we can see the degree. This is given in factored form. So we'd have to multiply it all out. Um, and instead of multiplying it all out, we do have the option of just looking at what the leading terms would be. So we have our 2. That's multiplied by what will be an x squared. And then this is an x. And then the x squared times the x is an x cubed. So this is a positive 2x cubed. The degree is odd. The leading coefficient is positive. That's going to be like x cubed. It's going to rise to the right and fall to the left. So we know what the end behavior is. Next, we'll find our x-intercepts, find the zeros, set it equal to zero, and solve. We'll get the factor of x plus 2 equaling 0, the factor of x minus 3 equaling 0. That gives us x equals negative 2 and x equals positive 3. The negative 2 came from a square factor. So we're going to bounce and turn around at negative 2. At positive 3, that came from a factor to the first power. So we're just going to cross at x equals 3. So we knew we needed to rise to the right. We knew we needed to fall to the left. We know that we need to bounce off of negative 2. So we've got to be coming up, bouncing, and going back down. We know at some point we've got to cross at 3, so we've got to come back up and cross at 3. So no pun intended, this graph is taking shape. If we want a point, that would be the y-intercept. Plug 0 in for x. 0 plus 2 is 2. 2 squared is 4. 0 minus 3 is negative 3. 2 times 4 is 8. Times negative 3 is negative 24. So the y-intercept would be negative 24. So we know it has to cross there. The shape updates.
So they're doing this extra thing right now to help us determine how to scale the graph. They're evaluating f of x at x equals 1 and x equals 2. We already did x equals 0, and we got our y-intercept. Here we're doing two more points. And that's showing us that uh, it was negative 24. So negative 24, and then at 1, we're down at Sorry, I lost my place. One, we're down at negative 36. And at two, we're down at negative 32. So we drop down to negative 36, and by two, we're already coming back up. That's just helping us get this shape of what's going on down here. We don't need it, but how do we know that when we cross here, we don't immediately start going back up? We need some idea of how we're going. So down, and then we started going back up before we hit two. Now, personally, I don't care. If you're drawing me a graph, as long as you hit the x-axis in the right ways, as long as you cross the y-axis in the right place, uh, as long as your end behavior is right, that's good enough for me. This is going to get very technical. Step four says use possible symmetry to help draw the graph. You can. I don't require that. But our partial graph that we have so far illustrates that we don't have any sort of symmetry. So we can just skip past that. So using everything we've done so far, we smooth out that graph. And then we check. Again, this wasn't a squared. There was another first power here. The x squared times the x gave us an x cubed. This is a cubic. The degree is 3. It only turned twice, so we're good to go there. But anything you draw me that bounces here, crosses here, turns at some point, and then crosses at three and goes up forever, uh, would be good enough in my book. That's it for this topic. The objectives of this topic are use long division to divide polynomials, use synthetic division to divide polynomials, evaluate a polynomial using the remainder theorem, and use the factor theorem to solve a polynomial equation. So first step in long division of polynomials is to arrange the terms of both the dividend and the divisor in descending powers of any variable. Then we divide the first term in the dividend by the first term in the divisor. The result is the first term of the quotient. Don't worry, we're going to go through this in an example. Everything's going to make sense. Then we multiply every term in the divisor by the first term in the quotient, write the resulting product beneath the dividend with like terms lined up, subtract the product from the dividend, bring down the next term in the original dividend and write it next to the remainder to form a new dividend. Use this new expression as the dividend and repeat this process until the remainder can no longer be divided. 
This will occur when the degree of the remainder, the highest exponent on a variable in the remainder, is less than the degree of the divisor. If f of x and d of x are polynomials with d of x not equal to zero, and the degree of d of x is less than or equal to the degree of f of x, then there exist unique polynomials q of x and r of x such that f of x equals d of x times q of x plus r of x. That is the division algorithm. And you can see our quotient is q, our remainder is r, our divisor is d. And just like with regular division, it can be written as um, the number equals the divisor times the quotient plus the remainder. Uh, this is the function, the polynomial version of that statement. So the remainder equals zero, or it is of degree less than the degree of D. So if the remainder is zero, we say that D divides evenly into F and that D and Q are factors of F. So if there's no remainder, then F of X is just D of X times Q of X. We could break our function up into two factors. We can't do that if there's a remainder. Now, if there is a remainder, we're saying that the degree of the remainder is less than the degree of D. In other words, we couldn't divide again. That's why there's a remainder. So let's divide 7 minus 11x minus 3x squared plus 2x cubed by x minus 3. The first thing that happens is they are trying to trick us. We can't divide when it's written like that. So we begin by rewriting our dividend in descending powers of x. So the 2x cubed would come first, and then our negative 3x squared, and then our negative 11x, and then our positive 7. If we were missing one, if there was, for instance, no squared, we would have to put a plus 0x squared in there. They all have to be accounted for from our largest down to the constant. x minus 3 is already in descending power. So we're dividing the long one by the small one. The small one is therefore on the outside of our division box. Our first step is to ask what times x gives us 2x cubed. 2x squared times x would be 2x cubed. So we write a 2x squared on top. We put it over the x squareds that we have. Now we multiply around the corner. 2x squared times x minus 3 is 2x cubed minus 6x squared. 2x squared times x is 2x cubed. 2x squared times negative 3 is negative 6x squared. We then subtract, just like long division, we subtract. But that means we're subtracting the first terms and the second terms. 2x cubed minus 2x cubed is 0. We orchestrated that. It's 0 because of our first step of saying that 2x squared times x is 2x cubed. Now we have minus 3x squared minus negative 6x squared. Minus a negative is plus, so negative 3 plus 6 is positive 3x squared. Bring down the next term. Do it again. But this time, instead of looking at the 2x cubed, we're looking at the 3x squared. 
x times what is 3x squared? x times 3x is 3x squared, specifically positive 3x. So we put a plus 3x on top above the x's we already have. Multiply around the corner, positive 3x times x minus 3. 3x times x is 3x squared. 3x times negative 3 is negative 9x. Subtract 3x squared minus 3x squared. That goes away. We orchestrated that. That worked out well. Now we subtract negative 11 minus negative 9. Minus negative 9 is plus 9. Negative 11x plus 9x would be negative 2x. Bring down the last term. Bring down the plus 7. Let's do it again. x times what is negative 2x? x times negative 2. So put a negative 2 above the constant that we had. Carefully multiply the negative 2 around the corner. Negative 2 times x is negative 2x. Negative 2 times negative 3 is positive 6. Subtract negative 2x minus itself is 0. That goes away. We orchestrated that. That worked out well. 7 minus 6 is positive 1. We have nothing else to bring down. Our degree, our 1, 1x to the 0 power. The 0 power of x is less than the first power of x, so we got below the degree of the divisor. That means we're in the remainder. How we're going to account for the remainder is how we would account for a fractional remainder in regular long division that didn't involve polynomials, if it just involved numbers. And that is that we would add on the fraction of our remainder over what we're dividing by. So we plus 1 over x minus 3. If we wanted to talk about the division algorithm then, 2x3, sorry, 2x cubed minus 3x squared minus 11x plus 7 would be equal to x minus 3 times 2x squared plus 3x minus 2 plus our remainder, plus 1 over x minus 3. f of x equals q of x times r of x, or sorry, times d of x plus r of x. Our function is equal to the quotient times the divisor plus the remainder. Now, synthetic division gets rid of all the x's. Uh, since our process every time was multiply, divide, subtract, uh, we lined up our x cubed and our x squared and our x. But outside of telling us, you know, which column we should be in, the x cubes, the x squareds, the x's, they didn't have anything to do with the actual calculations we did. 6 minus, or negative 3 minus negative 6. Negative 11 minus negative 9. 7 minus 6. So synthetic division is a way of dividing that is much cleaner to write and much easier to follow as long as you know the process. 
arrange the polynomial in descending powers with a zero coefficient for any missing term. So, so far, exactly like long division. But now we're just going to take C for the divisor X minus C. So whatever is subtracted from X is what our divisor is. If we have X minus two, our divisor is two. If we have X plus two, that's X minus negative two, our divisor would be negative two. And then to the right, we just write the coefficients of the dividend. We don't write the whole polynomial out, we just write the coefficients. We're gonna then take the leading coefficient and write it on the bottom row. We're gonna multiply C times that value, and we're gonna write that product in the next column in the second row. Don't worry, we're gonna look at an example. This is all gonna make sense. Then we add the values in the new column, writing the sum in the bottom row. We repeat until all columns are filled in. We just keep multiplying and adding, multiplying and adding. Use the numbers in the last row to write the quotient, plus the remainder above the divisor. The degree of the first term of the quotient is one less than the degree of the first term of the dividend. The final value in this row is the remainder. Okay, let's just jump right in. X squared minus 7X minus 6 divided by X plus 2. They're trying to trick us twice over here. The first place they're trying to trick us is notice we don't have any x squareds. So we're going to have to put a plus 0x squared in. And then x plus 2 is not of the form x minus a number. x plus 2 is x minus negative 2. So negative 2 is our c. We are dividing by negative 2. If we were looking at this fully, again, our plus 0x squared would be there. But all we're going to need is the minus 2 on the outside, and then our 1 from the x cubed, our 0 from the x squared, our negative 7 from the x, and the negative 6 from the constant. We're ready to go. So that's, this is our setup. Put our negative two that we're dividing by in the box, write the coefficients out. Leave space for a second row, draw a line. We're gonna take that first coefficient, we're gonna take this one and we're gonna move it directly below the line and rewrite it. Then we just multiply and add, multiply and add, multiply and add. Multiply, negative 2 times 1 is negative 2. Add 0 plus negative 2 is negative 2. Multiply, negative 2 times negative 2 is positive 4. Add negative 7 plus 4 is negative 3. Multiply, negative 2 times negative 3 is positive 6. Add negative six plus six is zero. We've filled in all the spots. We are done. This started as an x cubed. Our answer then would be one less than that, an x squared. So we have one x squared minus two x minus three with a remainder of zero. x squared minus two x minus three. That was a lot nicer than writing it all out and doing long division. We got the same answer we would have gotten with long division. Now that we know how to divide more quickly, we can use some theorems that require divisions of polynomials. Division of polynomials. I put the S on the wrong word there. One of these theorems is the remainder theorem. 
And I love this theorem. It's amazing. If the polynomial f of x is divided by x minus c, then the remainder is f of c. This doesn't sound earth shattering until you understand what's actually going on here. To get f of a number for any function, all you have to do is do synthetic division by that number. The remainder is the function value. So let's use that. We know how to find f of negative 4 for a function. We could just take the negative 4 and plug it in everywhere we see an x. We could do negative 4 cubed, multiply that by 3. Negative 4 squared, multiply that by 4. Negative 4, multiply that by negative 5. Add all that together and then add a 3. That would give us f of negative 4. But those are involving some very large numbers. Uh, 3 times negative 64, for instance. 4 times 16 plus 20. Oh, wow, 20. So they're not huge. But plugging in numbers into polynomials can get annoying uh, with the magnitude of the values that could be thrown at you. Instead, let's just use synthetic division to divide. We're looking for f of negative 4, so we'll divide by negative 4. Our coefficients are 3, 4, negative 5, and 3. Bring down the 3. Multiply. Negative 4 times 3 is negative 12. Add 4 plus negative 12 is negative 8. Multiply. Negative 4 times negative 8 is positive 32. Add negative 5 plus 32 is 27. Multiply. Negative 4 times positive 27 is negative 108. Annoying number says what? 3 plus negative 108 is negative 105. The remainder is negative 105. F of negative 4 is negative 105. But we didn't have to plug in and cube and square and multiply and add and subtract and add to get that negative 105. Instead, the remainder when we do synthetic division is the function value. Remarkable. Another theorem that we can use is called the factor theorem. Let f of x be a polynomial. If f of c equals 0, then x minus c is a factor of f of x. And if x minus c is a factor of f of x, then f of c equals 0. In other words, we're a factor if we have no remainder. So let's solve the equation 15x cubed plus 14x squared minus 3x minus 2 equals 0. Given that, Negative 1 is a 0 of f of x equals 15x cubed plus 14x squared minus 3x minus 2. So in this problem, we are given the information that negative 1 is a 0. If negative 1 is a 0, that means that x plus 1 is a factor of this polynomial. If we took this polynomial, if we factored it, set each factor equal to zero and solved, one of those values would be negative one. 
That negative one comes from x plus one equals zero. X plus one must be one of the factors. What's the other factor? If we're saying that x plus one is a factor, that means we can multiply by some other polynomial and get f of x. Well, how do we find a missing factor when we know one of the factors and the product? We can divide. So let's divide by x plus one. In other words, divide by negative one using synthetic division. Our coefficients were 15, 14, negative three, and negative two. And again, if I go back, 15, 14, negative three, negative two. Bring our 15 down, multiply, negative one times 15 is negative 15. Add, we get negative one. Multiply, negative one times negative one is positive one. Add, we get negative two. Negative one times negative two is positive two. Add, we get zero. That's expected. There's no remainder because x plus one is a factor. It divides evenly. What we got out of this process, what we didn't know, was that the other factor is going to be 15x squared, because it started as x cubed, 15x squared minus 1x minus 2. So the other factor is 15x squared minus x minus 2. We can then go on to factor completely. X squareds are things we know how to factor. This would factor to 3x plus 1 times 5x minus 2. And factoring is a required prerequisite skill for this level of math. We don't teach factoring in this class. Factoring is expected. If you want some review material on factoring, please reach out to me. But now we've factored the polynomial completely. That means we can go on to solve. Set each factor equal to zero. X plus one equals zero gives us X, minus, X equals negative one. 3x plus 1 equals 0 would be 3x equals negative 1. That's x equals negative 1 third. 5x minus 2 equals 0 gives us 5x equals 2. x equals 2 fifths. So the solutions to the equation. The equation being... 15x cubed plus 14x squared minus 3x minus 2 equals 0 would be negative 1, negative 1 third, and 2 fifths. And that's it for this topic.